Today's video is all about orbital rendezvous, wherein two spacecraft come together. We have one objective, and that's to know the assumptions for conducting both a coplanar and co-orbital rendezvous, and to be able to differentiate between the two. So we'll talk about each in more detail, but we'll start with coplanar rendezvous. So what does a coplanar rendezvous look like? Well, it involves two orbits that are in plane with one another. Typically, that means that they have the same inclination. So we're going to have two spacecraft. In this case, our interceptor spacecraft is going to be on this interior orbit, and our target spacecraft is going to be on this exterior orbit. And so what the maneuver is actually going to look like is very similar to a Hohmann transfer as before. So we're going to do something very similar to a Hohmann transfer where we burn once here to jump on this transfer orbit, and we're going to come all the way out over here. The only difference is we have to time this Hohmann transfer-like burn such that when we get to this point B, we're going, this target spacecraft is actually going to be there as well. So how do we figure out what that is? And we're going to call the amount of time that we have to wait in order to initiate this particular type of burn, we're going to call that our wait time. And we're going to have five steps to, uh, um, to figure out what our wait time is going to be. Our first step is going to involve calculating the angular velocities of both our target spacecraft and our inter interceptor spacecraft. And we use this equation that's very similar to our mean motion equation relating our angular velocity to the semi-major axis of whatever spacecraft we might be talking about. So we're going to have to do this for both our target and our interceptor spacecraft. So that's step one. Step two is to calculate the time of flight. So how long does it take this maneuver to happen? Well, um, just as before with our home and transfer, um, our interceptor spacecraft is going to travel along this transfer orbit for exactly half of its period. So remembering uh, Kepler's laws here, we're going to sweep out half of this orbit. So that's going to take half of the amount of time. So equal orbits equal, equal time, the half of the half of the orbit, half the period. There we go. That gives us our time of flight equal to half of the orbit period related to our transfer orbit semi-major axis. So that is our time of flight. So step three. How do we calculate our alpha lead, or our lead angle? So how much angle, angular distance do we need to have between, our, um, between uh, the time that we initiate this maneuver? Well, um, it's going to be related to uh, the speed, angular velocity of our target spacecraft. So it's going to have an angular velocity, and we're going to have amount of time that it's going to travel, uh, that the interceptor is going to travel along this path. And those two uh, multiplied together are going to give us our angular distance that essentially we need to lead our spacecraft by. And then we use what we're going to call our phi final angle as the relationship between pi, or uh, 180 degrees, or pi radians, and alpha lead to calculate what this phi final actual angle would be. And now we're almost done. We've got our, if you look on your equation sheet, you have one for wait time. It says wait time is equal to phi final minus phi initial over omega target minus omega interceptor. So the one piece I haven't told you about is uh, uh, phi initial. So what is phi initial? That's something that we're going to give you typically, and it's going to be measured from the interceptor to the target in the direction of spacecraft motion by convention. And this is going to determine how long it takes us to wait. So it, that kind of makes sense, right? So um, depending on what our initial conditions are, that's going to um, basically drive how long we have to wait in order to uh, we get all the stars to align such that when I do my home and transfer like maneuver um, the target spacecraft is actually in the vicinity and we can be traveling at the same velocity and do and accomplish our co-planar rendezvous. So the next rendezvous we're going to talk about is a co-orbital rendezvous. So before we had two orbits, now we only have one orbit. So we have two spacecraft that are along the same orbit, but we have an interceptor satellite that's going to be behind that of our target. So we would call this a target leading scenario. We'll talk about what it looks like for a target trailing scenario, but this is one of the really cool, interesting aspects about space um, that's a little bit counterintuitive, and that is, how do I catch up with something that's ahead of me? If we're both on the same orbit, how do I catch up? And intuitively, you might think, well, I just speed up. But it turns out if I speed up, I've actually 
uh, increased the size of my orbit, which means that it's taking me a longer time, a longer period, to get around to the same point. So I'm actually going to drift further and further behind. So in order to catch something that's ahead of me, I'm going to have to jump on a smaller orbit. So if you want to think of it, you kind of take a shortcut in order to catch up. And we call this short, smaller orbit a phasing orbit. And so this phasing orbit is going to be such that it takes me the same amount of time to go around my orbit for one complete period as it does for my target spacecraft to go around from its initial position to where we finally end up together. So this is what a co-orbital rendezvous is going to look like. And before we had a coplanar, um, and it was a uh, rendezvous, and that was very similar to a Hohmann transfer where we had two burns. Now we're going to have, you would think, just one burn because that's going to bring me back to this point. But if I don't do a second burn here, I'm going to stay on this green orbit. So it's also going to involve two burns. So coplanar uh, rendezvous, two burns. Co-orbital rendezvous, also two burns. So how do we figure out how big this phasing orbit needs to be? So we've got three steps here. Uh, the first is going to use some of the same equations that we talked about before, and that is we're going to need to calculate our omega target. Your um, a phi initial is uh, something that we'll give you. Again, it's measured from the interceptor to the target, so from the blue to the yellow, in the direction of spacecraft motion. So our spacecraft are going around the Earth this way, so this is how phi initial will be measured. And next, we'll calculate phi travel. Phi travel is just simply going to be 2 pi minus phi, phi initial. So 2 pi is essentially like 360 degrees minus phi initial, our initial angle, that's going to be phi travel. And once we have all those pieces, we can figure out the size of our phasing orbit using this equation here. So A phasing is equal to cube root, mu times phi travel over 2 pi omega target squared, all that guy. So that will give you the size of your phasing orbit. So what about if we have the target behind us? So before we had to slow down to in order to speed up. Now we're going to have to speed up to slow down. So if the target's ahead of us, our phasing orbit is going to be slightly larger. And we're going to have to go along this slightly larger orbit. And our target spacecraft is going to go around one and just a little bit more of a period to initiate or to end up back at the point where we rendezvous. So it looks something like this for both the target trailing and the target leading case, the rendezvous point will be when we initially conduct our burn. So we do two burns here again, and now we've rendezvoused with our target. So how do we size our orbit here, our phasing orbit? Uh, we're gonna have to calculate the omega of our target. We're gonna have some phi initial, again, interceptor to target in the direction of spacecraft motion. Our phi travel in this case is gonna be four pi minus phi initial instead of two pi minus phi initial. And we calculate the, the phasing orbit in the same way. So as a summation, uh, in summary, our co-orbital, if our target's ahead, phi travel is equal to 2 pi minus phi initial, just like you see on your equation sheet. If the target's behind, phi travel is equal to 4 pi minus phi initial. And a time of flight in both of these cases is going to be one period of our phasing orbit. So that is 2 pi times the square root of a cubed of our phasing orbit over mu. So hopefully that uh, you learned a couple things about what a, these maneuvers look like, and we'll see you next time. Hey guys, you know who it is. It's me, Major Cunningham from the Astro Department. As always, let's do a video. Okay, today we're talking about Rindisviz. Now, I'm no French speaker, but I'm pretty sure that's how you say it. Just kidding. So rendezvous. We're going to talk about rendezvous, and there's two different kinds of rendezvous that we focus really hard on in Core Astro. Well, the first, of course, is a coplanar rendezvous. That means that two satellites start off uh, in two different sized orbits. They're in the same plane, right? They have the same inclination, which puts them in the same plane, which is why we call them coplanar. Uh, but basically, if you see you know, a problem that says, well, um, uh, one satellite starts in a small orbit, and then another thing that it wants to rendezvous with is in the bigger orbit. Okay, so that's coplanar, and that's what we're going to be talking about first. And then the second kind, which we're going to get to a little bit later, uh, is called a co-orbital, which means if you heard something like this on the problem or read something like this, 
uh, or well, both uh, satellites are starting off in the same orbit, not just the same plane, but the same exact orbit. Um, I don't know why it sounds like that, but it does when you read the problem. That's how it sounds in your brain. I just, I just know. I just feel like I know that about you guys. Anyway, let's begin. As I have been doing, I've been using last year's homework since it's different than this year's homework, but it's still a really good example of how to do these problems. What we're going to take here is first, actually, let me get rid of this one so you don't see the ghost of that paper underneath. Uh, the first problem is, I tell you what, let me read through it and we'll, and we'll begin. The driving, Dragon Capsule, so if you guys don't know, the Dragon Capsule um, is SpaceX, you know, Elon Musk and SpaceX. It's his company's uh, capsule that they're trying to get certified eventually to carry astronauts into space. Uh, right now, I may be corrected on this, but as far as I understand, they're only certified to carry cargo and they've been testing it by carrying huge, you know, well, relatively huge packages of cargo, food, water, supplies, not water, but it's stuff up to the International Space Station for all the astronauts. And they've had some great successes with that. So anyway, that's what the Dragon capsule is. Think of it right now as kind of a, a cargo uh, spacecraft, if you want to call it that. And it gets launched into a parking orbit, as always, right? And it needs to rendezvous with the International Space Station uh, because that's who it's delivering the supplies to. Uh, this problem says that they're both in circular orbits and they give us two different uh, altitudes. Of course, they're giving us altitudes, right? Because they want to see if you guys can remember to convert altitudes into some major axes. And it gives us this stat that the Dragon capsule is currently ahead of the International Space Station. Okay. Documentation. I used myself. I am my own astro instructor. I am my own grandpa. It's a different problem. <laughs> okay. I'm going to use the space up here. A little bit of housekeeping. I tell you what. Let's use... Uh, this notation. So, of course, I've got my equation sheet out. You can see it here. Uh, I'm going to just calculate the sum of major axes first of all. And because these are circular, the sum of major axis of the target orbit, I'll draw that in a second, is the same as the radius of the target orbit, right? Because they're circular. And that's going to be 63.78.137. Plus the target. So the target is where we want to go, and that's the International Space Station. So we're going to add that there. Cool. 6828.137. Cool. Kilometers, of course. Of course, of course. And the interceptor is the Dragon capsule that has all the supplies in it, and it's going to do a little burn to get up there to that higher orbit. So let's find out how big its initial orbit is. And that's 6378.137 plus 325, which is the altitude they gave us. They are the makers of the problem. 6703.137 kilometers. That's just kind of some helpful housekeeping. Now, next piece of helpful housekeeping. Now you guys know me. I do love pictures and videos. In fact, you might argue that I need pictures and videos to learn the best. I know some of you guys are like that too. That's why I make these videos. Okay, so there's the Earth. Now, in Astro 310, the convention is that we typically represent the target with an X or a dot or, I mean, it'll be made clear to you which one the target is. I usually just use a, use a dot. So let's draw, let's say the ISS is we know it's in this bigger orbit. I'm just going to put it right here. We don't know when in time this is occurring, so I can kind of put the target wherever I want. The interceptor, it says, which is the Dragon capsule, right? Maybe I should say interceptor, right? Target for labeling's sake. The interceptor, it says, is currently ahead of the ISS in its own orbit is what that really means. So let's see. Here's how I draw that. We draw a triangle typically. So on GRs and homeworks, you'll see the interceptor is re represented by a little triangle, usually a blue triangle, in fact. So again, if we draw our position vectors out from the middle of the Earth, that's the one to the target. Or sorry, interceptor. Oop, interceptors are triangles, my bad. And that is the angle out to the target, which I've drawn with a, a big 
dot. Big circle. Okay, so the angle between these guys, you might think, well, there's about 30, it says it's 30 degrees ahead, the interceptor is. We always measure the angle between them, which is called phi initial, from the interceptor. We start at the triangle to the target. This trips so many people up, I can't even, you know what, I just can't even. So which one's the interceptor? Well, I told you the triangle is the interceptor. And if I draw from the interceptor all the way around this circle and get back to the target, the problem said that, oh boy, let's see. The problem said that this is 30 degrees worth, that the dragon capsule, the interceptor, is 30 degrees ahead of the target, which is weird, but actually happens in real life. I can just tell you that. So the initial is the angle from the intercept of the target, regardless of the targets being ahead or behind. So the initial is 330. Well, that seems weird, right? Because we traced out starting from the interceptor, almost a whole circle's worth minus 30 degrees. So the angle between them is 330. Now, housekeeping right away. Convert to radians, please. These equations, again, kind of like the orbit prediction problems, these equations are built to only use radians. So heads up. All right, so phi initial, the initial angle between the interceptor and the target, I get 5.7596 radians. It's pretty neat. Okay. All right, that's about the extent of my housekeeping for now. Um, let's answer the, the question here. What type of transfer must the dragon perform? Well, like I said at the beginning of the video, if you hear the problem say, well, well, the dragon capsule is in this smaller orbit and then needs to rendezvous with something in a <clears throat> foot stop different orbit, that's what makes it a coplanar rendezvous. All right, now it's asking us, how long will the transfer take? Well, that is actually not so bad, but we have a few housekeeping things to do first. So kind of much like a, a Hohmann transfer, in fact, that may be what it uses. It may not be, but the point is the interceptor is going to have to wait a certain amount of time before it actually fires its engines to go after the International Space Station and meet it in its orbit. That wait time is something we're going to calculate in Part C. We want to know how long the maneuver itself takes, that little transfer orbit. So we need to do some housekeeping first. Let's find the semi-major axis of the transfer orbit, eh? Oh, I'm going to move it all the way over to the left because I need all the space I can on this little homework sheet. Semi-major axis transfer orbit. It's just exactly the same as you did it back in home and transfer land. All right, we're going to do our target plus our interceptor over 2, and that's going to give us 68, oop, that decimal, why did I put that there? 6828.137 plus 6703.137 all over 2. Let's see what that gives us. Oh, yeah. to excuse me 6765.637 and then we get to use the same old time of flight equation that we used for home and transfer land right so the time of flight is going to be the period of this little orbit over two because we only spend half that orbit in the transfer orbit same concept as before i promise so that means we're going to do pi times a cubed over mu, and of course that's a of the transfer orbit that we just found, 6765.6370.5 cubed, 98600.5 equals cubed. Boom. 
square root, as some people say. And the, oop, I almost forgot to put pi next to this. That's partial credit for me, if if any credit. Dang man. So I get this comes out to be twenty seven sixty nine point one three four seconds. Notice the problem didn't ask for it in hours, so we can just leave it in seconds, and that's fine. For those who are curious, that's uh, just a little over 45 minutes, just for funsies. Kind of interesting to know. Okay, this is where you make your money. How long will the wait? Will the dragon capsule have to wait to begin the maneuver? Wait time. We abbreviate as WT. Whiskey Tango, to use the NATO phonetic alphabet. All right, again, maybe I haven't been doing as good a job in this video of showing you where I'm getting stuff from, but it's all, it, it's, so now in this lesson, we are flipping our equation sheet over, and we're in the top left area. And we're going to start using some of these equations here, which is pretty neat. Okay. Okay. So to ask how long, so this is what I was saying a little bit about before. The uh, interceptor can't just burn its engines at any time and expect to meet the ISS in its orbit. This is a really unique problem. You basically have to be an astronaut or a ground controller, I guess, because there's no astronauts aboard the uh, Dragon capsule. But the ground controllers from SpaceX say, okay, we're currently in the smaller, faster orbit with our Dragon capsule. It's up there with all kinds of you know, tang orange juice and delicious foods and space pizzas for the astronauts. Um, evidently, the Russians really love space pizzas, or so I have heard. Um, but who doesn't love pizza? I feel like that's a universal truth for the world. Anyway, my speculation. What is true, though, is they have to hack their watches exactly at the right time and then count up from the current time and say how long from the present moment uh, well, like, what's the countdown, basically, from a pre the present moment to when we're going to fire the Dragon capsule's engines to meet the ISS? This has to be timed so precisely to deliver space pizzas. Um, so why don't we work that out? That's what this wait time equation is designed uh, to find. And the wait time equation that we're going to be using is this WT equals phi final minus phi initial plus or minus 2 pi over omega target minus omega interceptor. Well... Okay, there's a little bit of housekeeping to be done. So as always, let us do our housekeeping first. So what is phi final? Well, it says on our equation sheet, phi final is the difference between pi and alpha lead. <laughs> okay, that's great. What's alpha lead? Alpha lead is omega target times time of flight. Well, well shoot, what's omega target? What I'm trying to get at in a semi-humorous way is we need to find omega target and omega interceptor. And off of our equation sheet, we found that Omega, which is this, it's not argument of perigee anymore. It means something different now. It means your angular rate. So basically, it's how, how much of a fraction of a circle per second are you going. This is how we find it. So our radius of our target was, we found... 68.28.137 cubed. Now, not to worry, this is going to be a tiny number. It's supposed to be a tiny number. Okay. 0 0.001119 radians per second. Definitely carry out the four significant figures in this because the errors, I mean, the, the numbers are so small that you need precision. So let's find out that angular rate of the interceptor now, which is the dragon capsule. Mu over R int, qubit. Okay, time to plug into chug. Zero point zero zero one one five zero radians per 
a second. Cool. Okay. Those are both going to come in real, real handy. What's the next thing we need to find? We found the bottom half of the equation with W or uh, omegas rather. Now let's attack phi final. Hmm. We need to start all the way up here with alpha lead. Let's get what alpha lead is. Equation sheet said that alpha lead is, uh, let's see, omega target times time of flight. Well, thankfully, we finally have both those things. So let's plug them in. Um, 0.09, 0.09, 0.09, 0.09, 0.09, 0.09, 0.09, 0.09, 0.09, 0.09, 0.09, 0.09, 0.09, 0.09, 0.09, 0.09, 0.09, 0.09, 0.09, 0
you're always going to be looking in Astro 310. I'm just telling you, you'll always be looking for wait time. With the coplanar rendezvous, that's what you're really, that's where you make your money. It's like, okay, hack my watch. Uh, hopefully, I didn't miss my last opportunity. When's the next opportunity to rendezvous uh, and burn my engines? Okay. So now, break, break. Let's do a different kind of problem. Let's do the other kind. And as before, let's read it off. Okay, so and interestingly, this homework continues the story as if it's a big story. Um, some problems do this, some problems don't. Some GR problems do this, some GR problems don't. So pay attention. The Dragon capsule is attempt attempting to rendezvous with the ISS. Okay, that's still true. However, it basically messed up problem number one, doing it due to a quote unquote steering malfunction. It ended up in the same orbit as the ISS. Hint, same orbit means coplanar. Oop, same orbit means co-orbital. Look, I'm really trying to emphasize this, and I still said the wrong thing. Co-orbital, I'm going to put little lights around it. Yeah, same orbit, co-orbit, right? Cohabitation, living in the same place, co-orbital, living in the same orbit. Okay, same uh, word stems and prefixes. When you see same orbit, think co-orbital. So it says that they're both in the ISS's orbit, which is nice. So, you know, this orbit with, with the size 6378.137 plus altitude of 450. We actually already found that. But I'm going to find it again and I'm start everything off as if we weren't given all this stuff. 6828.137 kilometers. Okay. Now, here's the crucial thing. It says that the dragon ended up 25 degrees behind the ISS. So the first part of the problem says, hey, man, draw a picture. Bruh, draw a picture. Use a triangle, like I said, to represent the interceptor, and an X represent the target vehicle. Okay. Uh, never a big fan of the X because it seems like we use that too much. But okay. Here is the Earth, right? All right. I'm going to go ahead and draw my circle an X through it. So that's the target. That's the ISS. It says the dragon is 25 degrees behind it. So I'm going to do my best to draw a blue triangle with a pencil. So it the black triangle. Ha -ha. All right, it says this angle here is 25 degrees. And that is good. As always, we're going to do the initial, and we're going to convert it from degrees to radians. Because these equations are only designed for radians. That ends up being 0.4363 radians. Cool. Now let's see. First things first. It says, I want to calculate the size of the phasing orbit the Dragon capsule must enter to complete the rendezvous. Okay, so like in class, your instructors will or should have discussed that the way that this actually works is the Dragon capsule enters a smaller orbit and just spends its whole time in that orbit and it waits for the ISS to come all the way back around and meet it at that exact location where the interceptor is right meow. So what we're going to do is calculate the size of the phasing orbit. As you might imagine, we've got some housekeeping to do. Here is the equation we're going to use. A phasing equals the cube root of mu times phi travel over 2 pi omega target. Okay, well, look. let's find omega target first. I would just like to get that out of the way. Mu over r cubed. They're both in the same orbit, so... Eight twenty eight point one three seven cubed equals again we had this from the last part of the problem. So if you if you have the situation in a GR where two problems are building off one another, you know, feel free to not calculate it again, but only do that. If you know the two problems are part of the same storyboard, if you want to call it that. Anyway, so there's that. Uh, 
what else do we need for a phasing? We need this thing called phi travel. Phi travel is something that is basically referring to only a co-orbital situation. And phi travel is how far angularly the ISS is going to have to go, or the target in this case, to travel to meet the interceptor back where it started. Okay, so phi travel is this. It says, if the target is ahead of you, phi travel is 2 pi minus phi initial. If the target's behind you, phi travel is 4 pi minus phi initial. Okay, well, in this case, our target, x, is ahead of the interceptor, so we're going to go 2 pi minus phi initial. So phi travel equals 2 pi minus phi initial, phi init, or as I have written it, phi sub i for initial. So let's see, 2 pi minus 0 0.4363, and that's going to be Five point eight four six nine radians. Okay, so now we have all the ingredients to calculate a phasing. Here's how I write it: mu times v travel, which we just found, over two pi omega target, which we also just found. That little thing is squared. This whole thing is raised to the one third power, or which is the same as writing a cube root. So let's plug and chug. The travel we found just here was 5.8469 over 2 pi 0 0.001119, all raised to the one third. That's what I get, 6508-ish kilometers for the size of the phasing orbit. Good, so that's the semi-major axis of our phasing orbit, right? That's a phasing that we just found. Ha! Ah, we did it. Kind of. Okay, next. The delta V total to require, or required to complete this maneuver now. All righty, this is something sort of special. So the way this works is the interceptor fires a quick burn against its orbital motion to slow it down. It enters this phasing orbit, and then it does a second burn in the direction of orbital motion to recircularize its orbit. Those two burns, burn number one and burn number two, are the same size. So here's what I mean by that. Here's how you could write this. Delta V total for your phasing orbit is equal to the delta V it takes to enter the phasing orbit multiplied by two. Now, this is weird. I know, because one burn, which is the same size as the second burn, makes it slow down. The next one makes it speed up in the same exact amount. So it re-enters the circular orbit to meet the ISS. So this is exactly like home and transfer land. Delta V1 is the same as absolute value of the uh, velocity at the transfer orbit minus the velocity of the original orbit. Let's find out what V1 is, eh? V1 is square root of mu over r, and that is square root of 3986.00.5 over 6828.137. You might say, well, I thought we already found the velocity of this orbit. We did. We found it in radians per second. I need to know it now in kilometers per second. All right. So this gives us 7.826 kilometers per second. VT1. We're going to calculate just like we did in home and transfer land. 
mu over r. This is just the r of the orbit plus epsilon. What should we call that? I guess just r. <laughs> and then this is negative mu over 2a of the phasing orbit. So what does this equal? Hmm. What are the chances I can fit it in this tiny space? 2, 8, 0 0.5, 68, 28, 137. Don't write this small at home, kids. Don't try this at home. 2 over 6508, 137. Okay. I'm just going to come down here. Woo! Things are running out of space. times 6508 to 2. Great. Times 2, square root of that. 7.5402 kilometers a second. So, delta V total equals VT1 minus V1, right? Times 2 equals... Oh boy, 7.826. Oops, nope, nope, nope. Let me put them in the right place. 7.4502 minus minus 7.826. Absolute value, right? All times two. These are supposed to be my absolute value signs. There we go. some flavor. Stand by. I'm checking my answers. Yeah. Yep. Maybe I found an error. A little fat fingering on my part. This should have been 7.6404. And so this should have been 7.6404. Good. Okay. 7.4502, which is correct. <laughs> Multiply those by two. There we go. Double check that the answer key. It should be 0 0.3805 kilometers per second. That's the total of the two burns it took to enter and then get out of that phasing orbit. Now, we've got a little bit of a trick question here at the end. How long must the Dragon capsule wait before it can begin this maneuver? Um, forever. N A. None. These are all acceptable answers because the target and interceptor share same orbit. Remember with the previous problem, we had to wait for the timing to be exactly right to fire our engines. Because we're following each other around at 25 degrees separation forever, then we can pick any old time to fire. So how long must it wait? You could wait forever, you could wait for never, you could wait for doesn't apply. Target interceptors share the same orbit, so that's why. Um, that's why they don't have to worry about a wait time. Okay, as always, thanks for sticking with me, and we'll see you guys next time.